Welcome, brothers and sisters in Christ, to episode four of Real Life, Real Gospel, sponsored by St. Paul Lutheran Church and School in Boca Raton, Florida. This week, we're discussing, we're studying, we're looking at the field of apologetics. And for those of you who don't know, the field of apologetics is the field that talks about defending your faith, explaining your faith, and as we move forward, we're going to get into the distinction between the different, I guess, definitions of apologetics and when each is helpful and when each is appropriate, um, and how that applies to an average person's life. This topic is courtesy of Reiko Zek. He's a buddy of mine from the seminary, and he put this forward on Facebook. And if you have a topic that you want to hear about, just like Reiko did, you can put it forward on Facebook or comment on Spotify or iTunes or whatever um, whatever platform you're listening to this on. Go ahead and comment, and I'll work your topic again. We'll get it in the lineup. We'll get it in the rotation. So with that... This is episode four of Real Life, Real Gospel, Real Defenders, Real Gospel. And as I always do, I like to start off, this comes from the text, this comes from the Bible. So our Old Testament passage that we're going to look at to to figure out what our relationship is to defending the faith comes from 1 Kings 19. There he came to a cave and lodged in it, and he refers to Elijah. Elijah. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the fire, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Some textual notes to lead us into our real discussion about this. Um, Elijah, for those of you who are unfamiliar with his story, he was a defender of the faith. At a time where Israel, God's chosen people, were not faithful to God, Elijah stood up for God. He stood up and said, this is the one true God. We should be worshiping him. We should be praising him, etc., etc. So, as we go forward, for the people have, have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword... So this isn't just a, they're, they're starting to move a little away from God. They are persecuting God and his prophets and his teachers and his people. So that's the context that Elijah is in here. And as we go forward, the Lord approaches him. And the, first, there is a great and strong wind that tears apart the mountains. The Lord's not in that. And then it's followed by an earthquake, and the Lord's not in the earthquake. And then there's a great fire, and the Lord's not in the fire. And then there's a gentle whisper. And that gentle whisper, it, God call, with that, God calls Elijah out and speaks to him. The Lord was in the whisper. So what I want to do here is I want to draw on this contrast that we see. Because God is talking to Elijah about his defense of the faith, about how he is upholding the faith. And he doesn't come to him in a strong wind that's shattering the foundations that he's that are around him. It's not shaking the earth. It's not burning everything down in a fire. It's in a gentle whisper. And 
With that, Elijah then runs to God. God is in the whisper, and what this does is this shows us the character of God. God is, is when he's approaching, he doesn't tear down the foundations around us. He doesn't shake the earth. He doesn't burn everything down. He speaks to us quietly in a whisper. And you say, well, what does that mean? I, I'm not in a cave. I'm not seeking God to literally speak to me. Why is this even worth bringing up? And the reason I bring this up is because as he, for in, in my understanding and my interpretation of this, he's almost giving an Elijah, uh, Elijah an example. He's saying, here's how I um, comport myself. Here's how I behave myself. And if we take that with the context of Elijah as a defender of the faith, I think what we can take from this is that this is who God is. He's not proving himself with an earthquake or a great wind or a fire. And with that, God doesn't need us to prove him. He's obviously capable of doing it on his own, but he chooses the quieter way. It's not a grandstanding, powerful argument. It doesn't tear someone's foundations away from them. It doesn't burn down something or everything that someone believes. What it does is it approaches them on an accessible level. And how this, I believe, connects to our defense of the faith, our explanation of the faith today, is we don't need to tear the mountains down. It's not our job it's not our power to tear the mountains down to start a great fire to to be this strong wind when we approach people i think we should take the example here and approach them in a whisper and i'm not speaking like literally only whisper to people when you're defending the faith i mean with quietness and gentleness and i have more encouragement to that as we go forward but what I, I want to really pull out of this Old Testament is that we remain faithful through whatever we may have to defend our faith from. And that is the key. That's the first first thing that Elijah is recognized for in our text. And then if you go forward, there's a recognition that also, yes, God calls people to stand up for him. But it's in a different way than we think of standing up for ourselves or standing up for someone in a worldly sense because God was in the whisper. So the real life of this, the real life application of this Old Testament story of Elijah is that we may feel persecuted or may feel like our faith is being attacked. We may even have a reality of persecution or our faith being under attack. And we may have to, quote, defend our faith, but my question is, why do we do it? And we're going to get into that as we continue. And the real gospel of this is God comes in a whisper. We don't have to have giant, blown out of proportion arguments with people. We don't have to be a metaphorical earthquake or strong wind or great fire. This, this call to Elijah that we can take up on some level today, it isn't a call to sacrifice what we believe, but it's also not a call to sacrifice the relationships we have. And as we go forward, as we get more and more into this, I think that's really important to keep in mind. And it's continued, where I want to continue this lesson, this discussion, is in Acts 17. Starting at verse 22, it says, So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive in e- that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it. Being Lord of heaven and earth does not live in temples made by man. 
nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives all mankind life and breath and everything. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is not actually far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Um, so some textual notes on this before we get into our discussion. We have the Aeropagus, which is a place of worship of many gods and of many different gods. And he's speaking in a place in Athens, which is a very philosophical academic society um a a good parallel today of the men of athens that he's speaking to might be people who identify as agnostic and that's who he's speaking to people who believe in a higher power but they're a little unspecific on what that higher power is And especially uh, in America, I believe this is a rising trend of people who say, yes, I'm sure there is a higher power. I don't know any more details than that. Um, So they have this, this altar to an unknown God, a God who is an unknown to them. Um, And what I think is really cool and what I want to draw from this story is that God through Paul connects to these people where they're at. He doesn't attack their beliefs. He doesn't go after the fact that they're in in the midst of altars to all sorts of different gods. He connects with what understanding they do have of God. And my message to you today, my connection to you today, as we consider this topic of defending our faith, is if we're in the midst of that situation where someone is challenging our faith, where someone is attacking or persecuting our faith. One thing we can do is connect with that person where they're at and show them the love of Christ in that way. So uh, some examples for you. Say someone believes in evolution, which we typically, if, if you are in a conservative, biblically Christian circle that says the Bible, that believes the Bible is the inerrant word of God. This is a... a difficulty for you. This is a challenge to your faith. Um, What I would encourage you to do is connect with them on common ground in that if they believe in evolution, they believe that the world around us is incredible and complex and there are some amazing patterns that are throughout creation. And I would connect with them on that. You say, I disagree with you on the evolution, but what we can agree on is that there's a design to everything around us. However it got here, it is incredible. And use that as a point to connect to God, to connect to the gospel. And you may say, well, that doesn't win the argument. We're not trying to win an argument. We're trying to connect people to the gospel. That is the goal here. So if you're talking to someone who... Um, has a view of love being love, who, who thinks that homosexuality and the LGBTQ community should um, be supported and built up in, in whatever their lifestyle is. Connect with them on the fact, shift the entire discussion, say love is love in that God loves every single person, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done. And connect on that level that everyone does deserve love because God has loved each and every one of us. And again, you're sidestepping an argument, which might be a discussion that you need to have later down the line, but you're sidestepping that argument straight into the gospel. If someone believes in humanism and everything humanity has to offer, you can point, humanity has done some incredible things. And connect on that point and say, you know, here's the inspiration for a lot of that stuff. 
Here's my inspiration to go forward. And you use that as an opportunity to share the gospel. If someone believes in the, uh, I, I don't know how we want to phrase it, you have sanctity of one's body, which comes into the discussion of abortion, of physician, physician-assisted suicide. You have this idea of, it's my body, I can do whatever I want with it. And we can actually transition that directly into a, a conversation about stewardship. Of God has given us these incredible gifts of our bodies. How do we take care of those? And and again, you're sidestepping an important conversation. And I'm not saying that a conversation doesn't need to be had. But if this person is opposed to the faith, is outside of the faith, I think the primary step frequently, we got to connect them to the gospel. We got to give them the, the reason for our hope. And I'm I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit there. Because we're going to talk about that. And with this, almost any hot button issue, someone can use it as a tool, as a weapon to attack or persecute Christianity. And what I would encourage you to do is to find some common ground and connect on that and frankly, sidestep the argument and connect to the gospel. And I think that's that's going to be a, a refrain going forward is this idea, sidestep the argument Go to the gospel. Because that is the core of what we're trying to do here. Is to connect people to Jesus Christ. All the other understanding, all the other stuff, that is bonus points. If you are connected to Jesus Christ, if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you're saved. And that's that's what we're called to connect people to. And it's at this point that I want to make a distinction. And that distinction is between defending and explaining. And this is something we're going to get at more as we go forward. But what I, what I have to say to you, brothers and sisters, is we don't have to defend our faith. God is God. God is the one true God. We don't have to prove that to anybody. It is reality. However, there are a lot of questions that come along with that. Understandably, if you believe in the one true God and you don't have questions about it, you haven't thought about it very hard, to be honest. So, we may be put in positions where we have to explain. They say, why do you believe? Why why do you persist in this belief of creation? Why do you believe that homosexuality is wrong? Why do you believe this? Why do you believe that? And there's an opportunity to explain, but I want to I want to distinguish that from defense. Even though one might say, "Oh, they're they're very similar." I think the difference is the attitude. If you are defending Your objective is to win. Your objective is to be right. If you're explaining, your objective is to help the other person. And if we think about the character of God, if we think about the character of Christ, even just that that we've looked at today, then we're called to help the other person. We're called to explain. We're not called to prove them wrong. We're not called to win. We're called to help our neighbor, to build up our neighbor. So the real life is we do have disagreements with people, and I don't want to discount that. If you go back to episode two of this show, I did an entire podcast on how we should handle disagreements. And I explicitly say we shouldn't ignore them. And and John 15 promises, it says, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me, and this is Jesus speaking, before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. We're promised we're going to have these disagreements. There are going to be people who attack and persecute and question. And that's the real life. Because in reality, our message is a hard one to believe. A perfect God is willing to humble himself to redeem a broken creation? If you look around at how complicated and amazing this world is, 
It's hard to believe that God created it all. So if we if we put ourselves in the shoes of a non-believer, in someone who is attacking or questioning, it's understandable on some level because this is hard to believe. It is foolishness to the world. The real gospel of this is, it's not our job to explain it to the world, to make it wise to the world. It is God's work to change hearts and minds, not ours. We present the gospel, we connect people to the gospel, and the Holy Spirit does all of the work. It is not on us to change hearts and minds. Even when we don't have all the answers, even when we don't understand, when we're asked questions we can't answer, we can be confident in God's work. We can be confident in the Holy Spirit. We can say, I don't know, but I trust that God is working, and I trust that God has redeemed me. And as we go forward, we, we, so we've established that defense of the faith shouldn't be an argument. It shouldn't be an aggressive thing we seek to tear down the other person, to prove them wrong. Instead, we should be sidestepping arguments and connecting people to the gospel, prepared to explain the gospel, prepared to explain how and why we believe what we believe, but not to tear down, not to win an argument. And as we go forward, what I want to say, or the the epistle that I want to connect us to is... 1 Peter 3, starting at verse 13, where it says, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So what I want to pull out for this text, what I want to highlight on this text, is even if you suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. There is comfort in that. Always be prepared to make a defense for the hope that you have. This is a discussion we've been having this whole time. Be prepared to explain the gospel, the hope, Connect to Christ. This isn't defending God. This is explaining your joy, which is a totally different thing. And the final point I have here is this line that I don't think we hear a lot, but it says, you're making a defense for anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. God comes in the whisper. We're doing this with gentleness and respect. And what I have to say in connection with this is no one ever came to faith in Jesus because they lost an argument with a Christian. So as we go forward, again, we're not seeking to win arguments. We're seeking to bring people to Christ. If you want to win arguments become a good lawyer. I don't know. So what I want to come to the conclusion, because the the question at the heart of this is apologetics, is the defense of the faith. When is it appropriate? What is it appropriate for? And as we've gone through these texts, as we've kind of looked at the defense of the faith, what I would want to say is apologetics is incredibly useful. If you have questions or if you want to answer questions, what it is not useful for is winning arguments. We're giving a reason for the hope that we have. It's not because we can answer all the questions. It's not because of what we can prove. It's not for the good we're called to. It's because of the promise of Christ. That's where our hope comes from. Like I said before, everything else is just a bonus. So the real life is we are called to be prepared to explain the reason we have hope. We're not called to argue. And what I want to put before you now is this does involve maybe some hard thinking or some research. And what I want to put before you are just a couple resources that have helped me answer questions that help me explain the reason for the hope that I have. 
There's a book. There's also a movie. I'm, I'm talking about the book, um, God's Not Dead which looks at a lot of scientific evidence and and how it points to Christ. There's a book by C.S. Lewis. It's it's called Mere Christianity. That is a philosophical, logical argument for God that is really helpful if if you have questions. It's, It's pretty good at answering them. I will put a disclaimer on both of these books. God's Not Dead is a fairly... It's not a super heavy text, but it is a, like a scientific ish book. Um, so it is, it, it's a more difficult read. Um, and mere Christianity is a, is a high level book. So, um, it may take a while to read and you may have to read things once or twice or three times before it actually makes sense. Um, and another great resource is the Bible. Just reading and knowing what it says. It's really hard to talk about the Bible and talk about what it says and what it teaches if you don't know, if you haven't read it. And one thing I would caution you about is um, Googling what the Bible says or looking at the internet because on both sides of the spectrum, there are a lot of people who say a lot of things about the Bible that um, are wrong. They proof text, they take things out of context to say what they want. Um, So be careful as you're looking at commentaries and posts and articles online. Make sure you check out the text and see what it has to say. So that's all the real life reality of this. The real gospel is our hope isn't in having the answer to everything. And God works in the midst of our misunderstandings. And all of, in all of this, even if we suffer, if we run into persecution, if someone is attacking our faith, even if we're suffering, we will be blessed. That's what this passage promises us. So in summarization, I would say defending the faith is bad phrasing. It's, it's not helpful language. We should be prepared to explain our faith, explain the reason for the hope that we have. Because the ultimate reason for the hope that we have is Christ, is the gospel. So this goal is to share Christ, to connect people to Christ. So if if you are curious about apologetics, if you want to study apologetics, if you want to be prepared to explain your faith, that's phenomenal. If the reason you want to study it is to win arguments... If you want to be some great defender who goes on a debate stage and wins arguments, you're studying it for the wrong reasons. Maybe don't study it because that's not the point. Like I've said over and over again, our goal is actually it's to sidestep the argument to connect people to the gospel. It's not to win the argument. It's to sidestep the argument and connect people to the gospel. And the real life, the real life reality of apologetics, of defending the faith, is we we live in a culture that loves to prove things, but it also loves to ignore proof. You see, because even if you have all of the proof for any given thing, it's not enough. Because we live in in a culture where truth is relative, so that's not the route to go when we're sharing the gospel. Like I said, you're not going to argue someone into faith in Christ. We might have to explain ourselves. We may have to say, this is why I believe what I believe. But don't get baited into a debate. That's not a good witness for Christ. That's not a witness to the hope that we have. And the real gospel of apologetics is that God works and God loves us even in the midst of understanding, even when we fail. And God can work through us as we explain the reason for the hope, even if it's imperfect. God will work through that. The Spirit works to change hearts and minds in incredible ways and in unexpected ways. And the reality of it is we have a hope in a God that loves us and a God that forgives and redeems us, that forces the world to ask questions. So we should. We should be ready to answer them. I hope this has been helpful. I hope this has uh, 
giving you insight into apologetics and the motivation behind it, the reasons to do it, the ways it can be helpful. If you have questions, that's what this podcast is for, especially if they come up in research. I'd love to get a Facebook message or an email from you that says, I was doing research on this and I have questions. And I'd love to go either either talk with you one-on-one or answer them in a podcast and talk about it at length. So I would encourage you, submit your topics. This has been Real Life, Real Gospel with Josh Laborious. Have a blessed week, brothers and sisters. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.